everyone. So here we are. We've made it to lecture nine. Um, this lecture will be over ethics and professionalism. And this is Lindsay Clark, your primary instructor for current topics in medical laboratory sciences. So um, let's get started. So the objectives for this lecture um, are going to be to define ethics and morals and discuss how they affect decision making behavior list the four principles of biomedical ethics and apply these principles to a case study, recognize the ASCP Code of Ethics and ASCLS Code of Ethics and explain how they relate to the laboratory profession, and discuss some common ethical issues facing healthcare workers and laboratory professionals. So let's start by defining ethics. Um, there are lots of different definitions of ethics. Bioethics, clinical ethics, medical ethics, these are all very similar concepts. So bioethics is the academic subject that focuses on ethical issues in medical practice. Clinical ethics is the application of bioethics to ethical questions in clinical settings. And medical ethics, much like clinical ethics, is a system of moral principles that apply values to the practice of medicine and in scientific research. Now let's define the basic terms and talk about the difference between them. So ethics is a set of moral principles or a theory or a system of moral values and morals refers to relating principles of right and wrong in behavior. So what's the difference between ethics and morals? Morals are more subjective. Uh, they refer to an individual's specific values regarding right and wrong. Ethics, on the other hand, refers to broader moral principles applied to the question of correct behavior. So for example, I cannot help you cheat on the exam because it would go against my morals, um, gives an example of morals. And a good example of ethics would be something like, our class debated the ethics of genetics today. Let me ask you this. So why do we even need to talk about ethics? Um, the answer is really because you, as professionals in the medical field, will likely be faced with some tough choices at some point in your career. Talking about ethics allows you guys to think about moral issues and develop tools to deal with these ethical questions. It also will provide a framework to help us find our way through difficult issues and can help in quick decision making in a crisis situation. Talking about medical ethics also permits us to, to determine what we should not do in ethical cases. There are four main principles when we talk about medical ethics or bioethics. These principles include autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, and justice. In addition to those, there are two other ethical principles that are important to know, and those are veracity and fidelity. So next, we're going to break down these principles and discuss them individually. We'll start with autonomy, which basically means allowing the patient to act as their own agent and make choices for themselves. So this concept allows for the patient to base their decisions on their values and beliefs. And sometimes that includes religious beliefs. One caveat to this principle, though, is that the patient must be competent and deemed capable of making their own choices. Capacity to make choices is presumed, and it falls on the healthcare provider to prove lack of capacity if suspected. If the patient lacks the decision-making skills necessary, a substitute decision-maker should be consulted. The substitute decision-maker can be the patient's spouse, children, parents, siblings, their nearest living relative, or it could even be a court-appointed guardian. Though autonomy is best practice for capable patients, there is a downside. So sometimes providers are so far removed from the decision-making process that the patients feel as, a, as they don't care. Um, and they were, the providers will remove themselves from that decision-making process so as to not um, overly influence that patient's um, choices. 
The next principle is beneficence. This means providers should do good for their patients or provide benefits to patients while minimizing harm. Secondary principles of beneficence include concepts such as presenting needless pain or uh, preventing the incapacitation of others. This principle is closely related to non-maleficence, which is the next principle that we'll discuss. As autonomy, um, beneficence also has a downside, that being the notion of paternalism, where the provider may make decisions for the patient based on their own values rather than the patient's values. Do good may mean different things to different people. So non-maleficence, um, this essentially means do no harm, which you hear in the Hippocratic Oath, it's at the very beginning where uh, physicians promise to do no harm. Um, but this principle has secondary principles as well, which include concepts like do not cause needless pain or do not incapacitate others. So something that's important to note here is that these principles can be met by doing nothing, where the principles under beneficence require prevention. The downside to non-maleficence is non-action by providers. Um, in this case, they may be unwilling to offer treatments if the benefits are questionable. And the fourth principle is justice. Um, this principle requires that goods and services, including medical goods and services, be distributed fairly. This should include transparency, accountability, and consistency in the distribution of goods and services. The downside to justice could include the restriction of higher end resources from those who can afford it. And transparency can also lead to inappropriate practices such as medical data mongering. Two other ethical principles that healthcare providers should follow are veracity and fidelity, like we talked about earlier. Veracity means that providers should be honest and truthful and provide full disclosure to patients. And patients need that full disclosure in order to make proper choices for their se themselves and their treatment. And fidelity simply means they should do as they say they will and respect the confidentiality of patients. So they, if they say that they are going to do something, they need to follow through with that. This means that patients will be able to trust them um, moving forward. And I also want to just quickly note here what medical ethics are not. So they are not the same as feelings and they are not religion or culturally accepted norms. It does not mean that you are just following the law and it's not an exact science. Ethics are complicated and they involve careful consideration of ethical principles, especially in decision making about human health care. Now, how do these principles fit into healthcare scenarios? Let's look at this example case study um, and we'll see if we can fit these four principles of bioethics into um, this patient's history. So let's say we have a 34 year old patient. She has a history of ovarian cysts and she's in danger of going into kidney failure if the ovarian cysts are not treated. Her provider has recommended an operation to remove the cysts as the best treatment option. However, our patient is deathly afraid of needles and is refusing surgery because of this. So in this case, the patient has the right to free choice and she is choosing to refuse surgery due to her fear of needles. The principle of autonomy means that her physician must respect that choice, even though that's the best treatment option. Beneficence, the principle of maximizing benefit and remember minimizing harm, means a physician should work with the patient to find an acceptable treatment which will prevent kidney failure. The next principle, do no harm or non-maleficence, simply means the provider should not force the operation on the patient uh, because that would be harmful to her. And the principle of justice means the provider should consider all the resources that would be necessary if the patient does go into kidney failure. If that happens, the patient would likely need dialysis, which would affect others who may need that same treatment. 
To make the final decision in this case, the provider really has to consider all four principles in order to do what is best not only for the patient but also for society. So what are some common ethical issues in healthcare? Well, informed consent is a big one, as well as refusal of treatment, which we saw in our example case study. So providers are responsible for making sure that patients are capable of understanding the treatment and capable of making the decision to accept or refuse that treatment. There can be lots of other ethical issues um, in medical research, such as experimenting with new medications without fully knowing the benefits or risks of these medications. And that brings up questions um, about if they're going to experiment with medications, who should they experiment on? And currently, there are also a lot of ethical questions surrounding genetics, genetic manipulation, and gene editing. So there was a scientist in China recently that edited genes in a set of embryos um, that were twins, and this has caused a really big controversy. So the question here is, is it ethical to edit genes in an embryo? And we also see ethical issues in resource allocation, as well as human re reproduction and life, death, dying, and killing. So in that sense, um, assisted suicide is a huge ethical qu question. But what about ethics for laboratory professionals? Since we are usually the behind the scenes players in healthcare, we actually may not encounter some of these issues that we just mentioned. However, as medical professionals, we should still follow the ethical guidelines put forth by professional agencies such as ASCP and ASCLS. The ASCP Board of Certification actually has a set of guidelines for ethical behavior that their certificates are expected to follow. These guidelines really focus on best patient care and reliability of lab work. Now this document is actually posted in Blackboard and it's one of the documents that I would like you guys to read over um, for this section. In addition to the ASCP guidelines, ASCLS also has a code of ethics for laboratory professionals. This code focuses on our duty as lab professionals to the patient, the profession, and to society. Now this document is also posted in Blackboard for you guys, and I would like you to also review this document. So what might some ethical issues be that we could face in the clinical laboratory? Well, the allocation of healthcare resources. Um, we, we talked about this with just general healthcare ethical issues. So what's the lab's role in this? Um, and some things, some questions we should ask ourselves, are we being good stewards of our resources? Have we eliminated unnecessary waste? Um, what do we do to limit unnecessary testing? If physicians are ordering um, testing that's unnecessary, is it ethical to just go run the test and not question it? Or is it ethical to question that um, and try to save that patient from unnecessary blood draw or unnecessary medical bills? Testing away from the laboratory is other, another question that we should ask ourselves. So what if we had a well-meaning group of volunteers that goes out to do HIV screening tests at a health fair, but they don't have the proper education on follow-up testing for positives? So if they test a patient and that patient comes up as positive and those volunteers don't know what to do next, is it better that that patient knows that they're HIV positive or is it not better? Because they may not get the proper follow-up, they may not get the proper confirmation testing. So what if that's a false positive? And molecular biology is another big one. Um, so molecular biology in recent years has allowed for a lot of diseases to be diagnosed or identified for which there may not be any treatment at this time. So molecular has allowed us to sometimes identify genes that are missing or um, uh, genetic issues that have been passed down um, through family members 
but there may not be treatment for any of these um, symptoms that are being caused by these genetic disorders. So is it best to use this kind of testing to diagnose these diseases or is it better for that patient to not know since there's no treatment available? So these are some questions that we need to think about as laboratory professionals um, when we think about ethical issues. So I want you guys to think about these concepts and really how they pertain to you as laboratory professionals. Um, along with this lecture, again, I want you to review the ASCP ethics guidelines as well as the ASCLS code of ethics. And I have also posted two articles about Jehovah's Witnesses and blood transfusions. And I want you guys to also read through those and really consider the ethical issues in those case studies. As always, please let me know if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, and I hope you guys are enjoying the class so far, um, and I hope to um, continue on with some more interesting um, topics for you guys.